Good afternoon. We have with us today a very special guest, I am pleased to say, someone who is no stranger to this briefing room, someone who is no stranger uh, to many of you, uh, our Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Toria Newland, uh, will offer some remarks at the top, uh, and then she will look forward to uh, taking your questions, and then we'll proceed with our regularly scheduled programming from there. So without further ado, Under Secretary Newland. Thanks, Ned. It is uh, an experience to be back in this, in this room again with, with old friends and new. Uh, I want to just start today by offering a heartfelt welcome home to our diplomats who, along with their military intelligence colleagues, have just recently returned home from Kabul to Ambassador John Bass, who I had a chance to greet at Dulles yesterday, to Ambassador Ross Wilson, who's returning today after serving as our Chargé d'Affaires since January of last year, and to the hundreds of other U.S. diplomats, military colleagues, and intelligence colleagues uh, who helped on the ground. We thank you for your courage, for your sacrifice, and for your service. I also had the chance when I was at Dulles yesterday to see the receiving center for uh, our Afghans coming off planes from the various reception centers overseas. And I have to tell you, seeing these incredible families and beautiful children being warmly received by volunteers at Dulles, it really makes you enormously proud to be an American. And while our diplomats have returned from Kabul, 
as you know, and we've officially suspended our presence there. Our ongoing intensive diplomatic work with partners and allies in Afghanistan continues. First of all, as you know, it is this department and the Secretary's top priority to continue to evacuate any American citizen who wishes to leave Afghanistan. We believe there are between 100 and 200 Americans who remain in Afghanistan who may have some interest in leaving, and the Secretary is leading our diplomatic efforts to ensure safe passage for them and for any Afghan partners and foreign nationals who still want to leave Afghanistan. And as the President said, there is no deadline on the effort to ensure safe passage for those who want it. Within this building, the Afghan Task Force continues to work 24-7 on evacuation efforts. And since August, of, uh, August 14th, the task force has been engaging American citizens in Afghanistan. They've made more than 55,000 phone calls, sent more than 33,000 emails, and this outreach continues today and will in the days and weeks ahead as long as there is a need. And from the region, hundreds and hundreds of U.S. diplomats are coordinating with third countries specifically those with after, uh, um, active diplomatic presences in Kabul to discuss safe passage options and other consular services. And as you know, more than 100 countries signed on to a joint statement earlier this week expressing our expectation that the Taliban will honor travel authorizations by our countries. And on Monday, the UN Security Council adopted a very strong resolution that calls on the Taliban to honor their own commitment to allow safe and secure and orderly departure for, uh, from Afghanistan for Afghans and all foreign nationals. Uh, as this ongoing evacuation and relocation operation continues to date, as you know, 123,000 people have been enabled to leave Afghanistan, including 6,000 American citizens and tens of thousands of at-risk at Afghans. Uh, our temporary residence locations in the Gulf have the capacity to process some 37,000 people on a rolling basis, and more than 65,000 Afghans and others have transited through the Gulf, with Gutter being the largest Af uh, evacuation site. And our temporary transit locations and joint bases in Europe have the capacity to process 28,000 people on a rolling basis, and all of them have been very active as well. Total of six countries, and I think it's 10 locations overseas for processing. And each transit center offers humanitarian support, including meals, medical care, other necessities. Our diplomats work there hand in hand with service members and uniformed officers from CBP, from TSA, from all of the other agencies who are working round the clock, first to get American citizens home as soon as they land, and then to run biometric and biographic screening on the Afghan evacuees before they are brought to the United States or processed for a third country. And we're enormously grateful to the huge network of countries that have provided critical assistance for our evacuation efforts, partners and allies, Bahrain, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Georgia, Hungary, Italy, Kosovo, Kuwait, Pakistan, Qatar, Spain, Switzerland, Turkey, Ukraine, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, and others who have helped transit Americans and others to, safe, to safety. Our close coordination uh, with our allies and partners remains critical, both on evacuation and relocation, but also as we begin to scope uh, our ongoing relationship with the Afghan people and uh, with the Taliban. Uh, in the last few weeks, as you know, Secretary Blinken has made more than 50 bilateral calls to foreign leaders and met virtually with both his G7 and NATO counterparts. And on Monday, he convened a virtual ministerial that included Canada, France, Germany, Italy, J Japan, the UK, EU, and NATO, as well as Qatar and Turkey, to discuss the facilitation of safe travel out of Afghanistan, including reopening Kabul civilian airport. And we expect that in uh, coming days and weeks, that intensive multilateral effort will continue. Deputy Secretary Sherman's made dozens of calls and convened conversations on a regular basis with deputy foreign ministers and political directors from more than 27 uh, allied and partner governments, uh, sharing updates, sharing information. Uh, I've been burning up the phone lines as well, including uh, with political directors and my G7 counterparts. 
And as uh, you heard the Secretary announce earlier this week, while we've suspended our diplomatic presence in Kabul, we have set up our Afghan office in Doha, led by Ian McCary, to manage diplomacy in all of its aspects uh, with Afghanistan and to work with allies and partners who have also relocated uh, their operations uh, to Do Doha. This will include consular affairs, providing humanitarian assistance, uh, working on counterterrorism issues, working on political and security issues. So uh, just as somebody who spent uh, almost 33 years in this department, I will say that this is one of the most difficult and certainly the most enormous efforts that I've been involved with stretching all across the department, all across the interagency, and all across the globe. Uh, and uh, I am personally, I know the Secretary is, enormously proud of our people, but we've got a lot of work still to do. Over to your questions. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to the podium. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure you missed it. I, I won't say us, I'll say it. I'm sure you missed the podium. I missed you too. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, <laughs> Without a doubt, seeing what, you're, what you described yesterday when you went to Dulles and seeing the Afghan families get, getting off the planes, I'm, everyone I think understands that, but I think everyone in this room either has personally spoken to or has colleagues who have personally spoken to uh, U.S. citizens particularly or LPRs, like green card holders, who were being assured, who are still in Kabul, who did not get out who were being assured up until the very last minute that, hey, we know where you are, you're not going to be stranded, and now they've been s stranded. So what are you telling them now, uh, presuming that you're still in uh, contact uh, with these people, particularly as reports start to increase about the Taliban doing exactly what they said they wouldn't do, which is exacting revenge uh, uh, on people? And I'll let someone else ask about the SIVs. but. That's what, what is the message right now to U.S. passport holders and families who are like all green card holders who were not able to, to get out? Well, Matt, as I said, these efforts did not end on August 31st, and they will not end until uh, we have secured the evacuation of any American citizens and LPRs and folks who worked with us and served the American people who want to get out. So we've been in contact with them in the last uh, 24 hours to tell them that we are looking at all possible options, air routes, land routes, uh, to continue to find ways for them to help evacuate and to support them in that. We're trying to ascertain who precisely still wants to leave, who their dependent family members are, what routes um, may or may not feel comfortable to them. We're also working intensively, as you know, with uh, countries on the ground who are trying to get the civilian airport open. Uh, we're also looking at land routes, talking to our allies about how that might work and how that has worked. So we're looking at all possible options, but we're also conveying to them that their safety and security is of paramount concern to us. And as, as you have said and as we saw during the military phase of the uh, evacuation, we have profound security concerns. It's a very volatile situation, and the Taliban have to demonstrate that they can uh, maintain security for the rest of this. People's confidence in the United States was, has been shaken, perhaps irrevocably, by the fact that they were being told as recently as over the weekend uh, that you knew where they were and that they weren't going to be stranded, and yet they were. So what precisely are you telling them other than we're doing everything that we can to try to get you out, even though it's clear that you don't have a way to do it yet. Well, the messages are being tailored depending upon who they are and where they are. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of that, but the first thing we have to do is ensure that we can get air routes and land routes secured, and that's what we're working on. But what we mostly need to understand is, is to continue to evaluate who is where, uh, who they have with them, so that we can uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, do what we can to, to tailor uh, evacuation routes for them. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Um, thank you, Madam Undersecretary. So I have two questions. One is basically following up on that, but I want to expand it to the SIVs as yes. well. And I understand you may not be able to share precise plans, but 
for example, one of the people that Matt mentioned is somebody that I spoke to in his first story that we put out today. And this is a US passport holder, and he has six daughters. None of them are American citizens. Yeah. And basically, he was assisted, but he was told to come to the airport alone. To, and that was the only way for him to get out. So for someone like this, what is the guidance at the moment? Are you giving any guidance about overland routes? And my second question is a little bit wider, um, and that's about Taliban recognition. Um, I just want you to talk a little bit about the US strategy on how to deal with the Taliban, because the focus has so far has been on the evacuation. Where is the United States with that? We see that Europe coming to maybe accept the reality that they have to deal with the Taliban a little bit earlier than the United States. If you could just update us on where you're thinking on that and what are you talking about that with your allies? Thank you. Well, first of all, be interested after this uh, about any information you have about this specific American. As you know, the guidance to Americans throughout has been that uh, we were eager to assist them, their spouses, and their minor children. So I'm not sure about this report that you have, but it doesn't track with the way we have been uh, dealing with these cases. As I said, we are working on trying to get that uh, supporting those partners on the ground who are trying to get that airport open. Uh, and we are also looking at land routes. I think on land routes, I don't want to be any more specific because, as you know, um, it is uh, a long journey with lots of dangers, and we don't want to uh, further endanger folks who might be involved in that. And the recognition? Uh, on the question of recognition, you know, we have obviously had contacts with the Taliban. We had it during the, the effort that we were trying to uh, midwife a negotiation. Those uh, conversations have continued intensively to enable the evacuation of, of that we undertook and to try to get the kinds of guarantees of safe passage, et cetera, and, and tolerance, and to talk about the standards set in the UN Security Council resolution to talk about the terrorist threat as well, because the expectation is that they, they claim to be able to control the security of Afghanistan. We'll see if that, if that is the case. That is a far cry from formal recognition. Uh, we will continue to uh, have conversations that serve our interest, uh, as will our allies and partners. Uh, but the first thing we want to see is them live up to the obligations that they have under the UN Charter as well as the public statements that they themselves have made about their expectation for an Afghanistan that respects human rights, respects international law, allows international citizens and Afghans who wish to to leave. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, has the number of American citizens still on the ground changed? For example, have any of the people who were on the fence about leaving or said they were going to stay changed their mind in the last few days since the U.S. withdrawal was completed? And then realistically, what is the earliest timeline we could see the airport reopen? Do you have firm commitments from anyone to help with the operation of that airport? Um, so just to say, I don't have information about the, how the phone tree calls have, have gone over the last 24 hours. I would say that as a general matter, um, the messages we get from some of these Americans who have not yet left sometimes vary over the course of time. You know, they have differing situations. They may have um, elderly relatives who don't want to leave, and therefore their own decisions about leaving are um, complex, let's put it that way. They may have other reasons that they, that they want to stay. So I w I, without giving you specifics, I would say that what's most important is that we remain in constant contact with everybody on our list because needs are changing, perceptions of um, interest are changing, uh, as well as, um, you know, availability of how, how we would work with them. Um, and with regard to the airport, you know, the, there are a couple of countries with representation in Afghanistan. I think we've talked about Qatar, we've talked about Turkey, who are working with the Taliban to try to get the airport open. They have, I'll let them speak for themselves, they have relatively optimistic projections about when that will happen. Um, but, you know, we, we need to see it happen, obviously. Sean. Uh, thanks. Um, could I follow up a little bit on Humara's question on recognition? Uh, what's the message that the United States, if any, is giving to other countries and what they're to recognize? 
as you know, there are reports that the Taliban may announce some sort of government in, in the coming days. Uh, first of all, what are, your expe- what, are, what, is, what are the U.S. expectations for that government, including on inclusivity? And is there a message to other countries on whether or not to recognize this government that they announced? Uh, I think I'm not going to go too far down this road other than to say that we stand by what was in the UN Security Council resolution. Those are the international community's expectations and the UNSC's expectations for a Taliban-led government and the way it will govern and the way it will interact with the international system. I think we need to see them live up to their own commitments and live up to the standards set by the UNSC before we go very far down this road. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you, say. Uh, very quickly, you, the President, Secretary of State, they, keep, they all keep saying, we expect the Taliban to honor their commitment. What is in their history uh, that actually points to the fact that they will honor these commitments? I mean, you know, that's quite a journey from the time they went in to obliterate them, destroy them, blow them out of existence, to today when you are actually counting on them to honor their commitment. Well, Saeed, I think you just made our point that we're not going to take them at their word. We're going to take them at their deed. So they've got a lot to prove based on their old track record, as you know. Um, now, they also have a lot to gain if they can uh, run Afghanistan far, far differently than they did the last time they were in power. Um, and they have said that they want to be welcomed into the international community. Well, we set that standard in the UNSC uh, resolution on Monday, and it's really now up to them to form a government and manage the country in a manner that lives up to those standards. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam uh, Under Secretary. Welcome to the podium. Thank you. If I'm, I'm really I'm having a flashback here. I really, it's <laughs> I know. Faces are the same. We'll come back to the virtual room. Um, mm-hmm. If well, I may, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I may ask about SIVs. Is the State Department advising Afghanistan SIV applicants to transfer their cases to embassies or consular offices outside of Afghanistan? If so, has the State Department received assurances from the Taliban that they will be provided safe passage and necessary travel documents? The reason I ask is because our sources on the ground who uh, SIV applicants like receive new advisory telling them to transfer the case to nearby embassy. But the, 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 the difficulties they cannot get out of the country because they may need to get the passport from the Taliban to leave the country. So if you would like okay, to Okay, well, I, I don't want to get too much into the complexities of consular work because I will, you know, mess it up. But let me simply say that first we have a large number of SIV applicants or SIV eligible people who are currently being processed already for entry into the United States or they have already arrived. If they already had their SIV foil in their passport, then they can come right in. If they were halfway through processing, then that processing has to be continued wherever they are. Um, And they are also uh, on our priority list if they are still in Afghanistan to try to help them to evacuate if they so wish or if they are at risk. Now, some SIVs have found themselves, uh, or SIV eligible folk have found themselves at in countries other than where we have our transit centers. And in that case, they can appear at U.S. embassies and consulates and make their claim known, and we can receive them for processing there, if that makes sense. Would you consider electronic? I'm sorry? Would you, uh, (coughs) would the State Department consider providing, issuing electronic uh, documents? So for those uh, folks who are still in Afghanistan, uh, who have a claim to come and who we want to help evacuate, part of this process will be to ensure that they have a document, a travel document from us that the Taliban will recognize because they have said that they will allow folks who have a legitimate travel document to evacuate. So as I said, some already have that document, some have an electronic document, some we may need to work on um, building a a named document and and we're looking at all of those things and working on them. Take one final question, Uh, I know you said that you'll monitor the Taliban's deeds here. 
But less than a month ago, Secretary of State Blinken said from that podium that uh, international recognition, along with international aid, the lifting of sanctions, he said none of those are going to be possible if the Taliban seeks to take the country by force. They now have done so. And so why aren't all of those things inherently off of the table? What does it say about America's word here that they, that they aren't? Uh, I didn't say that recognition was on the table, did I? Uh, you know, we, we ha what I said was uh, our relationship with the Taliban will be guided by what they do, not by what they say. Uh, now, that said, there are some urgent questions, uh, like the humanitarian condition of the people of Afghanistan. So we are looking at those kinds of things, how we can continue to provide humanitarian aid without benefiting uh, any government that is formed. Those kinds of things are natural, but we have made no decisions about any of the rest of it, and we certainly won't uh, unless and until we see the kinds of behavior expected in the UN Security Council resolution. Great to be with all of you. Thank you, Undersecretary. Okay, Please thanks. Come back. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we resume taking questions, let me just uh, speak to a couple issues. Uh, first on Ethiopia. Uh, nearly one month after USAID Administrator Samantha Power was on the ground there in Ethiopia, uh, she emphasized the dire humanitarian catastrophe that faces over 5.2 million people. Uh, the situation on the ground has only gotten worse since then. From the beginning of the crisis in northern Ethiopia, the United States has called for a negotiated ceasefire and unhindered humanitarian access. The truth is that access has been limited to but a trickle by the government of Ethiopia. Warehouses sit empty in Tigray because the government has put a stranglehold around the region. Trucks with life-saving assistance continue to remain idle, as Administrator Power uh, herself lamented a month ago, while desperate Ethiopians slide closer to famine. While we are concerned about any and all reports of humanitarian assistance being diverted from, uh, from those for whom it is intended, humanitarian assistance must be allowed to reach populations in need by the government of Ethiopia and all parties. That includes the TPLF. Uh, these parties must cease the violence that only worsens, worsens the current situation. All right, uh, so with that, uh, I believe we have one additional uh, topper. Uh, we remain deeply concerned over the continued det detention of U.S. citizen Danny Finster, uh, who was working as a journalist in Burma. Yesterday, Danny marked his 100th day in detention. Journalism is not a crime. The family, the detention of Danny Finster and other journalists constitutes an unacceptable attack on freedom of expression in Burma. We continue to press Burma's military regime to release Danny immediately. We will do so until he safely returns home to his family. With that, uh, happy to resume your questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I just want to drill down a little bit into this 100 to 200 that, the who remain, mm -hmm. U.S. citizens. These are passport holders, right? This does not include LPRs? That is correct. Well, what's then? You must have some estimate of LPRs who are who are still there who want to, who want to get out, and if you don't, why not? Well, Matt, uh, we let me let me first start with this issue of the the 100 to 200, 200 and to reiterate uh, a couple pieces that Under Secretary Newland said. Um, we've been at this point of 100 to 200 over the past couple days. Uh, you heard this from Secretary Blinken. You heard this from uh, the president as well. But it is also true that over the past couple days, and in fact overnight, um, we have been in touch with everyone in that remaining 100 to 200. And we do have a little bit more fidelity uh, on that group uh, that we've been able to garner over the past couple days. Uh, we have said that the number is likely closer to 100. Everything we have seen uh, over the course of the past 48 to 72 hours indicates that is, in fact, the case. Uh, the number is likely uh, closer to 100, perhaps considerably closer uh, to 100. Again, this number is dynamic. Uh, 
uh, it will go down. And in fact, we have received confirmation that some of the individuals we initially included in this range of 100 to 200 uh, were in fact uh, never in Afghanistan or were not in Afghanistan when we were doing that outreach uh, or have safely returned home in, in recent hours. I'm asking about green card holders, right. who you also have a responsibility to, along with the SIVs and other SIVs. But we, now I'm just asking about green card holders. Was there a decision made at some point to forget about those people no. and only allow U.S. passport holders in and onto that in, into the airport through your checkpoints, not the Taliban checkpoints, but through your checkpoints and onto <clears throat> and onto planes because. A lot of them feel like they, frankly, got screwed here and that they were lied to because they had been told by people on the task force, just what I mentioned to Tori, mm -hmm. that we know where you are. We're not going to let you, we're not going to strand you. Uh, don't worry, stay tight, uh, hold tight. And, and, and now, you know, what do they do? I mean, are you in touch also with the green card holders? So Matt, the last 24 hours? so let, let me start by saying we have a special responsibility to American citizens, uh, and that is spelled out in 22 U.S. Code, Section 4802. Uh, it is spelled out in some detail there, the special responsibility we have to U.S. citizens. We also do have a commitment to LPRs, to lawful uh, permanent residents, and we have been in touch uh, with, those in, with LPRs. We had good reason at the time to, to be in Afghanistan, uh, as the evacuation operation was underway. Uh, so when we first started messaging American citizens, uh, SIVs, other at-risk Afghans, we absolutely did uh, and continue to message lawful permanent residents. Uh, uh, so let me, let me just uh, make, make another point here. Uh, we have been consistent in that messaging uh, that we will do during the course of the evacuation, everything in our power and space permitting uh, to bring them to safety on a U.S. military airplane. Now, of course, our commitment has not expired. That commitment endures. Uh, and now we remain committed uh, to bringing them uh, out of Afghanistan if they should choose to do so. When it comes to the number, we have gone to, to some pains to explain how we arrived at the figure of approximately 6,000. Uh, when it comes to American citizens. That is a figure where we have the greatest fidelity, again, because our first responsibility and our, our first commitment in all of this has been to American citizens and American passport holders. The number when it comes to LPRs is, of course, going to be larger. Uh, it is going to be uh, a more, and it has been, a more complex endeavor to determine with any specificity uh, what that number may be. We've been able to refine it. Uh, we believe that uh, we have uh, effectively been able to message uh, this universe of individuals, but we're just not able at, at present to give you a firm figure as to how many LPRs may be in Afghanistan uh, who wish to leave. But again, our commitment to them remains. If there is an LPR in Afghanistan who indicated a desire to leave uh, before or who changes his or her mind in the coming days, weeks, months, or beyond, uh, we will help that person. We will help that person depart Afghanistan. Right. The family that I'm referring to, and possibly the family that Humaro is referring to, I mean, they were told, you guys do know. It, it defies logic to think that you guys don't have even a rough estimate of the number of LPRs who are, who are out there. We, we have endeavored throughout this to provide only numbers in which we have a high degree of confidence. Uh, that is why many of you have asked about reports that uh, the number of Americans was much higher uh, than it actually was. Uh, there have been a lot of numbers thrown around. We have done everything we can to provide you with information that is both timely, but that is also accurate. Uh, and given the complexities involved in boiling down uh, a number like that, not only taking the number of, of LPRs, uh, but then boiling it down to how many of those LPRs may wish to leave the country, uh, that is something that will take time for us to offer publicly with some degree of precision. Mara. Um, yes, there is actually a, um, a story that's just out there from Politico, um, citing three people familiar with the matter that Ross Wilson, um, charged affair, former charge affair of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, re recently tested positive for COVID and that he currently has only very mild cold-like symptoms. 
Can you confirm, deny, or say anything about this? You, I hope you're not surprised to hear me say uh, we, of course, are not in a position to speak to anyone's uh, private uh, health records. What I will say is that when our officers come out of Kabul uh, and they uh, spend time in a transit point, uh, they are tested for COVID as a matter of course. Uh, and so we are taking all appropriate precautions for individuals who are coming out of Afghanistan. Look, uh, I don't have to tell you that individuals who uh, are being uh, relocated, who recently left Kabul, have been involved uh, in um, uh, one of the uh, most uh, ambitious, um, uh, one of the most intense uh, operations this department and this government has ever uh, undertaken. Uh, they have uh, been around, I would presume, quite a few people. Uh, the uh, social distancing uh, may have been uh, difficult at times. Uh, and so that is why we are taking these precautions for anyone uh, who is uh, who has recently come out of Kabul? Sure, he's just traveled on a plane, though. So I I, I can assure you that if we knew uh, someone had tested positive for COVID, uh, we would take appropriate precautions to relocate uh, anyone like that back to the United States. Okay, I have one more on um, your favorite, which is numbers. Um, in the briefing earlier today, a senior State Department official basically said a majority of the Afghan asylee applicants were still in Afghanistan. So based on your commitment to get them out, surely you do have an estimate um, or a number how many people they are. Can you give a rough number, tens of thousands, thousands, close to 100,000? So I can give you a little more specificity, but let me uh, just explain uh, why we're not yet in a position to provide a firm number. Uh, as we've said, during the evacuation process, our first priority, our priority, was putting as many people on as many planes as quickly as we could. And of course, we brought uh, to the United States or to third countries uh, about 124,000 individuals. Uh, of those individuals, most of them have not yet arrived to the United States or to the third countries where they will undergo um, processing. And so we are not yet in a position to have specificity because they are not yet, in, in most cases, in our system uh, to determine how many may have been SIVs, how many may have been uh, our locally employed staff, how many have, may have fallen into the P1 uh, and P2 category. Uh, but in terms of a bit more specificity, uh, DHS is processing individuals uh, back in the United States, uh, as you know, and we do have some preliminary data based on that DHS processing. Uh, since August 17th and through August 31st at midnight Eastern time, uh, 31,107 people have arrived at, uh, to the U.S. as part of this operation. Uh, so of that subset, which of course is just a, a small subset of the 124,000, uh, we understand that about 14% are U.S. citizens, or 4,446, about 9% our LPRs, uh, 2,785, and the remaining 77%, 23,876 individuals are Afghans at risk. And of course, falling into that category uh, are SIVs, uh, other uh, visa holders, uh, P1, P2 referrals, uh, and perhaps others as well. So it is fair to say that the vast majority uh, of individuals who, who were evacuated as of August 31st uh, fall into the category of Afghans at risk, uh, and many of them will be SIVs. I should also hasten to add uh, that the U.S. citizen figure here, the 14%, uh, that's 4,446, uh, as you know, we've, we ourselves uh, evacuated approximately 5,500 and probably more uh, U.S. citizens. So that's the vast majority of U.S. citizens. So these initial figures probably overcount uh, U.S. citizens because our first priority, as we've said, as I was telling Matt earlier, uh, was uh, and is to U.S. citizens, to U.S. passport holders. So as additional individuals come to the United States, uh, we expect the proportion of other categories of LPRs and Afghans at risk uh, to, to rise. What was the start date for that? You said August 17th. 17 to 31? That's right. Uh, Sean. Sure. Can I ask you about the issue of uh, the journalists uh, from Radio, uh, Radio Ozadi? Uh, there's, of course, been a lot of concern about uh, 
first of all, there are estimates of the numbers issue. There are estimates about how many are there. There's estimates of, a hum, of hundreds. Uh, do you believe the United States has done everything that it can to, uh, to help these people get out if they choose to? And what's the game plan now for helping uh, journalists from Radio Azadi to, to leave if they so choose? We will continue to do everything we can. We're not talking about this in the past tense uh, because our efforts have not ended. Our efforts uh, will endure. Um, we have made a commitment to those who have served the U.S. government, uh, to those who have served the U.S., uh, the American people, uh, to, um, of course, American citizens and lawful permanent residents as well. Uh, so you heard from Under Secretary Newland that we are uh, considering all possible options to facilitate the departure uh, of individuals in these categories from uh, Afghanistan. As a predicate for that, uh, we have worked with the international community, uh, more than half the country, half the world's countries, uh, the, all of the uh, most important uh, stakeholders have signed on to the idea that the Taliban uh, must uphold their commitments of safe passage. Uh, that was job one, to underscore that predicate and to make clear to the Taliban uh, that should they not uphold that commitment, the international community uh, would be uh, in a position to hold them accountable to that. Number two is working on these uh, uh, potential routes for departure. Uh, and I mean routes literally, uh, and we, we've talked about overland routes, uh, but also pathways like civilian airports. Uh, well before uh, the military, uh, the last military plane left, uh, we had engaged in diplomacy with uh, countries in the region to include Qatar, to include Turkey, uh, brought in uh, the private sector as well to do an assessment uh, of the airport. And our goal is to support a safe reopening of this airport just as soon as we can for two reasons. Number one, uh, to allow the provision of, of humanitarian supplies uh, to the Afghan people. You need a functioning civilian airport to do that. But number two, of course, uh, is to provide a means by which those uh, to whom we have a special commitment uh, to depart the country. That's what we're working on as quickly as we can. We're working to support uh, the efforts of our partners uh, on the ground, and this is a priority for all of us. I, I want to change topics, if I may. What, let me just let's take a couple more questions on Afghanistan, and then and then we'll uh, we'll come back. Yes. The, so just to drill down a little bit, I've been speaking with an American citizen today. His parents, sister, and grandmother are stuck in Kabul. They tried to get out of the chaos. They couldn't. And State Department's telling them today that the it could be days, and they haven't communicated a, a plan for them. And so my question is, what assurances, what confidence can you give them? because it seems to them that you're telling them you don't have a plan and then in the larger sort of numbers category since we're doing numbers have you gotten any american citizen out since the last flight left on august 30th uh, so what i will say is that we are exploring uh, all possible options uh, to bring americans to bring uh, lprs uh, to bring those to whom we have a special commitment out of afghanistan if they should choose to do so uh, when we have options for these individuals, and I say when because we are, uh, we have a commitment and we are going to continue to do everything we can uh, to uh, support their desire to leave the country, uh, we will communicate directly to them uh, personalized instructions uh, on what they should do, when they should do it, uh, and how the United States government feels we are best positioned uh, to help them do that. So. I can't speak to specific cases, but what I can say broadly is that specific individuals in Afghanistan, uh, to include American citizens and others, uh, who um, may have recently decided they wish to leave the country uh, or were unable to leave the country during the evacuation or might decide tomorrow or next month or next year that they wish to leave the country, they will receive uh, specific tailored messages from us uh, as we develop and start to operationalize these plants. And yes? Did, did you have a number for have any Americans gotten out since that last flight? I, I don't have uh, I don't have data to provide on that front. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, the Taliban had showed interest that the U.S. would continue its diplomatic presence in Kabul. Uh, what were the reasons for why you moved your diplomatic presence from Kabul to Doha? Was it because of security reasons, or secondly, you don't recognize Taliban as of now? Uh, it's not either or. Uh, our first priority is the safety and security. Uh, of the American people. We've talked about this in different contexts today, but that certainly applies uh, to our diplomats and other uh, professionals who would be serving in any diplomatic mission around the world. 
Uh, and we made the judgment uh, for, I think, reasons that should be understandable to everyone, uh, that it was not a, uh, appropriate uh, for us to maintain a diplomatic mission uh, in Afghanistan at this time, given the security environment. Now, on top of that, uh, there are other issues of uh, recognition and uh, what our diplomacy towards any future government in Afghanistan might look like. We feel that we are best equipped uh, to approach any future government in Afghanistan from the team we have on the ground that is already oper uh, operating on the ground in Doha. Uh, we are aided in that endeavor by the fact that a number of other countries around the world uh, have offices in Doha where they have engaged with the Taliban previously, uh, where much of this uh, multilateral diplomacy has taken place. So we came to the judgment, as have many other countries, uh, that a perch from Doha was the appropriate setting to undertake this. Connor. One more question. Um, former President Ashraf Ghani, I think you, you call him a former now. Right. He, he has said that uh, in his talks with uh, President Biden last conversation, which was reported today, uh, that there were 10 to 15,000 Pakistani soldiers in the Taliban group who he is using the word invasion of Afghanistan. Do you see the foreign troops within the Taliban, foreign forces within the Taliban who have who are now ruling Kabul and Afghanistan? I, I'm just not in a position to to comment on that to confirm uh, those reports. Um, if we have anything more, we'll, we'll provide it. Yes, Connor. On the, uh, the issue of land rights, I know you don't want to give a lot of operational details, but can you just say whether or not that would involve any U.S. government assets helping people get out of the country? Uh, you are right that I do not <laughs> wish to provide any more details sure. there. Can yes. I just another follow-up? Yep. Um, there was a, a Qatari flight that landed today at Kabul airport. Um, was the U.S. at all coordinating with the Qataris on that? Have you made any progress in terms of reopening the airport? So this is something that uh, the Turks, that the Qataris, uh, that uh, together with uh, forces on the ground uh, are working as quickly as they can uh, to reopen the civilian airport. This was an endeavor that we continue to support in every way uh, we can because we believe it is important for our own interests. Uh, again, that includes uh, the potential to bring additional Americans, LPRs, and others uh, out of Afghanistan if they should choose to do so, but also as a means by which to provide humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan. Uh, we have coordinated closely uh, with the Qataris, uh, with the Turks. Uh, we had worked, um, um, uh, again, from a pragmatic basis with the Taliban on this question uh, as well. Uh, but I'm not in a position to comment on specific flights that may land. Mullen, who apparently tried to make his way to Afghanistan, um, contacted the U.S. ambassador in Tajikistan. Can you speak to what contacts he may have had with the State Department and whether or not he successfully got to Afghanistan? As you know, the State Department does not routinely comment on the travel plans of private American citizens or uh, members of Congress for that matter. Uh, but we have made it abundantly clear uh, that travel to Afghanistan is not safe, and is, it is something that we certainly do not recommend. Uh, we have a level four travel advisory uh, issued for Afghanistan. Uh, we have issued a series uh, of increasingly urgent warnings to the American people and, by extension, the broader public uh, over the course of months and, in fact, uh, over the course of 20 years uh, regarding the potential dangers uh, of travel to Afghanistan. Uh, when it comes to our missions abroad, um, every single embassy of ours, and this includes our embassy in Dushanbe, uh, has a foremost responsibility uh, to look after uh, the welfare of American citizens. Uh, and our team has been intensely focused on uh, assisting Americans um, uh, who, may, who may have been exiting uh, Afghanistan into Tajikistan in, in recent weeks. But, um, I will leave it at that. Yes. A follow up to the embassies. Um, the Under Secretary was saying you are in contact with countries that have still a presence in Kabul. Uh, what do you expect from European countries like the UK or Germany, or what are your expectations in general there? What well, can they do that you can't? Well, before we get into the dynamics of what engagement with any future Afghan government might look like, uh, a couple things need to happen. First, uh, there has to be uh, on the next Afghan government. Uh, and of course, uh, that has not been formally formed uh, just yet. Uh, more importantly, uh, the international community needs to get a sense not only for what that government is in name, but what it does in deed. 
uh, before we are able to make any judgments about what is in our national interest, what's in our shared national interest for any potential practical engagement or not uh, with any such future government. So what we're doing now, rather than talking about, well, who is going to uh, have a presence on the ground or uh, who is going to engage practically in what way, uh, right now we're establishing uh, a set of uh, shared uh, expectations uh, for any future government in Afghanistan. And you have seen those shared expectations emerge in any number of forms. Uh, Secret Under Secretary Newland mentioned uh, the UN Security Council uh, resolution. Uh, we have uh, spoken collectively uh, and singularly as a G7. Uh, NATO has spoken to this uh, as well. The Secretary convened a ministerial uh, with some of the region's important stakeholders and some of our closest allies. So there have been any number of opportunities, any number of fora uh, for us to establish uh, this shared set of expectations, uh, this shared set of criteria uh, for what we collectively may or may not do vis-a-vis -vis any future Afghan government. But I understand the Undersecretary was referring to the point that you'd still try to get American citizens out of the country. Right. That so. Practically, what can countries like UK and Germany do right now to help you there? Well, uh, we are in this together. Uh, and I know that uh, the British government, that the German government, uh, there are other governments uh, who are doing precisely what it is that we are doing. Uh, and that is uh, conceiving of uh, plans to help our citizens, to help those who have helped our governments and our peoples uh, over the years to depart Afghanistan should they choose to do so. Uh, for obvious reasons, we're not detailing what those uh, plans might entail just yet, uh, but it is something that uh, it is a shared priority across governments. Uh, and in every one of those uh, multilateral engagements, there has been a discussion of the priority we attach uh, to helping our citizens depart Afghanistan should they choose to do so. Uh, take a final question maybe on Afghanistan, Jenny. Yeah. Um, on the 100 to 200 figure net, is that exclusively based on people who have registered with the State Department? Are you working with any, you know, Hill folks or outside groups who are in touch with LPRs and American citizens on the ground? And then I have one more. So it's an inclusive figure. Uh, in the first instance, it was uh, put together based on individuals who had registered with us. Uh, and that there were individuals who had registered with us prior to August 14th. Uh, and of course, this was a, a large and expansive number uh, because, again, um, people register and don't unregister. Sometimes people register who are never in Afghanistan to begin with. Um, uh, so we whittled that universe down, but then we've also uh, issued subsequent messages uh, to um, Americans that they should follow these steps to ensure that they're in our system. Uh, so that is how we arrived at the ultimate figure of some 6,000 uh, and the remaining uh, 100 to 200 that's likely closer to 100. But any time uh, someone comes to us and says, uh, I know of a U.S. citizen uh, who is here and these are the uh, contact details, uh, those are details uh, that uh, we very much welcome. And so every one of you who raises a case of an American citizen here, uh, it's, it's one thing to raise it here. It's very important uh, t uh, that you also ensure that those details are provided to us so that we can ensure that we're doing everything we can as appropriate uh, to help these American citizens. And where is Special Representative Khalil Zad? Is he in Doha? What's his role going forward? So my understanding is that he has returned uh, from Doha. Uh, as you know, we have a team in Doha uh, that is now led by Ian McCary, uh, our former DCM uh, in Kabul, who will continue uh, to, to lead that office. Uh, as is often the case, however, uh, we do have a, uh, there are some cases in which we have a diplomatic mission, but we have a special envoy or a special representative. Uh, so just because we have uh, an office in Doha uh, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there is not the need for uh, another position associated uh, with it. Now, Will he still be at the State Department, though? Like, is, is he going to remain as that special representative? He is, he is returning here. Um, uh, he is a special representative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, we, we haven't announced any changes to titles uh, or personnel. It's appropriate now to have a special envoy for peace. You know, his that, Twitter handle is... Well, Matt, you were, you were using some dated information, my friend. It is the special representative for Afghan reconciliation. That's too long for... I'm talking about his Twitter handle. Right? <laughs> okay. I, I don't know what his Twitter plans are. Uh, yes. Thank you. So, um, Taliban, the Taliban in China... Uh, during Secretary of State Blinken's conversation with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, 
on August 29th and August 16th, did the Secretary ask China not to recognize the Taliban bilaterally? And was there any discussion on Uyghurs who live in Afghanistan? Because there are fears and concerns they may be deported back to China. And if you could entertain um, preview secretary, where will he be next Saturday, which is the 20th anniversary of September 11? Uh, I fully expect the secretary will mark uh, the solemn anniversary of the 20th anniversary of, of September 11th. We'll have more details uh, on that as the date approaches. Uh, when it comes to our engagement with the PRC, this is uh, Afghanistan is an issue that we have discussed at high levels with the PRC for uh, some time now. Uh, it was not only in the most recent conversations between the secretary uh, and uh, Foreign Minister Wong, uh, or prior to that, Director Yang, uh, that this was brought up, but in other senior level engagements to include Deputy Secretary Sherman's engagements uh, with her counterparts, uh, this was raised uh, as well. I wouldn't want to characterize beyond that the, the uh, substance of those discussions. Uh, I would note, however, that uh, in order for a UN Security Council resolution to emerge from the UN. Uh, no country, no permanent member can stand in the way. And in fact, a resolution did emerge uh, from the UN Security Council. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, another uh, China-related question. So today, uh, there's a, a Chinese uh, order that goes into effect. It's a maritime order stating that all international vessels uh, must report to, uh, to Chinese maritime authorities their uh, cargo and, and other relevant I information. And so I'm wondering if the State Department has any response to this. Uh, we got word from the DOD that they're saying uh, unlawful and sweeping maritime claims, including in the South China Sea, pose a serious threat to the freedom of seas, including freedoms of navigation and overflight. Uh, and so being that the State Department has made uh, quite an issue of maintaining f a free and open Indo-Pacific region, wondering what sort of uh, reaction the State Department is going to have, what sort of uh, 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 discussions they may uh, have with China, or have there been any connections with China or discussions with China about this edict that goes into effect today? So at the core is the principle of a rules-based international order. Uh, and our um, uh, our steadfastness uh, in standing by the principle uh, that there should be a uh, universal uh, set of rules uh, for all countries, large and small, uh, to include in the maritime domain. This is something that we have discussed with our partners and allies in the region. Uh, it has been a staple of our discussions in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it has also been a staple of our discussions with the PRC, and we have not been shy about lodging our protests uh, and together, in many cases, with our partners uh, and allies, standing up to unlawful, uh, excessive maritime uh, claims of uh, the PRC. We will continue to, to do that. Said. Sorry, can I ask, has there been any connection uh, to, with respect to the edict that, that goes into effect today? Uh, if we have a reaction to that, I'll, we'll, we'll get that for you. Thank Said. you. Last, year, last week, uh, there was an agreement in this building, apparently, on uh, uh, allowing Israel into the visa uh, waiver program. Now, when the law was passed back uh, during the 113th Congress, I believe, you know, public uh, law uh, 113, 296, it's stated clearly, the version that passed, that Israel must cease its uh, discriminatory ag uh, actions against Palestinian Americans. You know, they, they were always denied entry and so on. And my question to you, because the version that passed clearly stated that Israel must satisfy, you know, the requirements and, and the, the parameters that you guys set. And my question to you, will the Biden administration ensure that this law is followed and that Israel remain uh, ineligible to join as long as it continues to discriminate in its entry policies toward Palestinian Americans? Saeed, so when it comes to the visa waiver program in Israel, uh, and this, I believe, was mentioned uh, in the readout of uh, the president's meeting with the prime minister uh, as well, uh, we support steps in the bilateral relationship that would be beneficial to both of our peoples. And one such step 
uh, is working together towards Israel fulfilling uh, the requirements of the program, of the visa waiver program. Uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, in consultation with the Secretary of State, uh, is authorized to designate countries to participate in this program, the VWP, uh, provided that the countries meet all the requirements. Uh, our experts have been in talks. Obviously, in recent days, there have been higher level uh, talks, and we're prepared to enhance consultations as Israel works on addressing the program's requirements. Now, uh, just a quick follow-up on the Palestinian issue, but you still hold Israel uh, responsible to fulfilling these requirements, correct? There, there is a set of requirements that, that any and all countries must fulfill in order to join the visa waiver program. In, in the past few days, uh, there were meetings between, there were meetings between this, uh, the Israeli Defense Minister Gantz and the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. There was a meeting between Abbas and, and Sisi. There's talk about a meeting between uh, Bennett and, and President Sisi of Egypt. Are you involved in any of these talks? Are you, you know, whether directly or indirectly, are there any talks between the, this administration and any of these, uh, the Palestinians, the Israelis, the Egyptians on this issue? Well, when it comes to Israel's engagements uh, with its neighbors, with other regional stakeholders, or the Palestinian Authority's uh, engagements uh, or meetings, um, we would refer you to uh, those entities uh, to uh, detail that. But what I can say broadly uh, is that we applaud uh, the parties doing whatever they can uh, to maximize productive communications uh, that we hope throughout the region with Israel, with the Palestinian Authority, uh, will reduce tensions uh, and improve the situation on the ground. Uh, this administration believes that a negotiated two-state solution is the best way uh, to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, and we have made clear on a number of occasions uh, that Israel, Israelis and Palestinians al alike deserve to share equal measures of safety, of security, of prosperity uh, and dignity, and that is what we continue to work towards. Uh, I'll take a, a final question. Uh, Sean. One small one on India I have. Uh, Sean. I'll be brief. Um, the European Union uh, has um, has uh, recommended uh, or, or taken a step toward uh, reimposing travel restrictions on Americans, especially non-vaccinated Americans. Uh, does the United States have any stance on this? Is the, would the United States accept this? If it, or would, would it be upset if this were to go forward? Does this at all affect uh, American thinking on, um, on reducing travel restrictions for Europeans? Well, we are following uh, this issue closely. We do appreciate uh, the transparency uh, and concerted efforts of our European partners and allies uh, to combat this epidemic. Um, as the conditions evolve, uh, we regularly update U.S. travelers uh, and encourage all travelers to visit our website uh, for the latest information on COVID-19. Um, we, uh, as, a, as a broad proposition, look forward to the resumption of travel, uh, travelers between the United States and Europe, uh, travel between the United States and all regions uh, just as soon as it is scientifically uh, advisable. Uh, as you know, the, Europe, the EU announcement uh, also distinguished between vaccinated and unvaccinated travelers. It continues to be uh, the position of uh, this administration uh, that vaccines are safe and effective, uh, and in this case, uh, they are effect effective for uh, facilitating the travel to the EU as well. Just a uh, quick follow-up, really quick. Did you see Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid uh, said that Biden administration plan to reopen the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem is a bad idea. Does the U.S. have a response to that? Um, and the second one is about Danny Fenster. I think you guys have said that you lost contact because of the protests in prison. Have you been able to see him or um, reestablish contact since then? When it comes to our uh, CG in Jerusalem, uh, Secretary Blinken has addressed this on a number of occasions. Uh, in May, he said, quote, the United States will be moving forward with the process to reopen our consulate in Jerusalem. Uh, we don't have any updates uh, to share at this time. Uh, when it comes to Danny Fenster, yes, um, we have uh, been uh, in more uh, recent uh, contact. Uh, let me just, uh, the, the, uh, as you know, Danny marked uh, his 100th day in detention uh, on August 31st uh, yesterday. Uh, we continue to seek regular contact with Danny uh, and spoke with him by phone re most recently on August 27th. Uh, we are also regularly in touch uh, with the Finster family as well. Just on the, on the Consul General, so you, you're aware of this argument that's being made by some in Israel that, that, that you guys need to have specific permission 
uh, agreement from the Israeli government to reopen the consulate building as a consulate. Um, there is a counter argument, and I want to know if the administration agrees with that, which is that since this consulate general was actually is actually older than the state of Israel itself, uh, and although the building was closed as a consulate, its staff was moved into the Palestinian Affairs Unit at the embassy, that it is not technically opening a new consulate or even actually reopening a closed consulate. Is that the is that the argument that this that that, that this administration is? Um, well, Matt, as as you just holds? aptly demonstrated, I don't think it does uh, me or us any favors to weigh in on uh, what is a uh, complex legal and historical uh, issue. But as the secretary has said, we will be moving forward with the process to reopen our consulate in Jerusalem. Lalit. Uh, India's foreign secretary Ashwat the Shingla is in town. Do you know if he has if he has any meetings in the building tomorrow or day after? Uh, we will update you with any uh, uh, meetings, uh, any uh, updates to the schedule, uh, and we'll provide those as we're able. Thank you Thank all very much. You. Thank you.